have you with us this morning. Will you stand and worship? song for you this morning, and uh, it's called Gone, and uh, it's a medley. Who knows what a medley is? And we get to take two songs that are awesome and put them together and make one song that's awesome. And you guys will hear it towards the end of one song. You'll hear it go right into the next song, and it's uh, uh, No Longer Slaves. And um, so when we put these together, we take two awesome songs, and we make really one big awesome song, and uh, we're excited to, to, to introduce it to you guys this morning, so.
This morning we thank you. We are humble before you, God. Our eyes are open, our ears are open, God. We're listening to you. In Jesus' name and all God's people's name. Amen. Amen. You guys can take a seat. This is the part of service where we get to get connected with you. So if you would, in the seat backs in front of you, grab this connection card. We're actually going to be filling this out together today. And if you are a first-time guest, we want to say welcome. We are so excited that you are joining us today. And if you would take the time to fill this out, 
we're going to be donating a dollar to the Restore Network, which is an amazing organization right here in Madison County that provides hope and healing for foster families. If you're a regular attender, we want to say that we if you take the time to fill this out, not only are you going to be registering your attendance, but also to let us know of any prayers or phrases that you may have. So let's take 30 seconds right now and fill this out together. You guys are finishing that up. Let's take a look at the screen. Hi, everyone. This is Matt Wilkie coming to you from Feed One, a program of Convoy of Hope. This month, we are so happy to partner with all of you to help provide nutritious meals to children in need. Feed One is a campaign that supports Convoy of Hope's children's feeding program. Currently feeding more than 200,000 children in 14 countries, Feed One believes a nutritious meal shares hope, opening the door for a child to be healthy and well-nourished. Every two check-ins this month will feed a child in need. So remember to check in this month and invest in the future of children around the world. Thank you. Man, good morning. Awesome. Welcome to our church. My name is Larry. If we haven't met, it's an honor to have you here. I am the pastor of our church and just had the privilege of bringing the word of God to you today. So excited for that. Uh, we are in week two of a sermon series called Becoming a Champion and Learning How to Stand. And so we're going to talk about the different postures of standing and, and what that looks like. Uh, if, you, uh, if you weren't here for Valentine's Day, I just want to rub it in a little bit. We had an incredible time here. We had a comedian friend of ours come in town from We Start Churches, and I'm not joking, I laughed so hard, my, my, my bladder bled. You know what I'm saying? That's how bad it was. So we laughed and laughed and laughed, and we learned some things about people in the audience. <laughs> that was um, incredible. And so you don't want to miss it if we do it again. God is good, and uh, we're excited that you're here today. And uh, as we've been talking about this idea of becoming a champion, Oftentimes we think a champion is, is something uh, is, is earned, the, the, the term champion is earned because we've, we've accomplished some great goal or some great feat or we beat somebody and it's a competition type thing. However, how the world defines a champion and how God defines a champion are two different things. See, becoming a champion to God isn't just about what we've done, right? It's not about what we just stood for. It's not just about why we stood for something and actually becoming a champion for the kingdom of God encompasses that but also is about who everybody say who it's about who we stand for and so we're going to talk about becoming a champion what it really looks like to be a champion because in the world you'll be chasing a, a lot of things in this world that in your mind are going to make you one up against the person next to you and we can just engage in this uh, it's really this competition that is not building each other up it's really it's putting ourselves up above other people instead what we want to do is we want to build them up so they can come up with us amen who wants to be in heaven by themselves that would be crazy right i don't think i'd be in heaven if it's just you know like god's like oh, you failed this pat you failed this one too and so today here's the thing just like daniel we have to make a choice and here's the here's the thing when we make a choice to choose the path of least resistance or will we choose the path where we have the courage to make a stand not just a stand not a political stand but a stand for the kingdom of god that's the question will we take the easy path or say all paths lead there or will we make a stand that stands for the kingdom of god and see daniel if you understand about anything about daniel as we're in Daniel uh, chapter 4 this week, Daniel lived in a time where the nation of Israel rejected God and they were paying the price for it. You ever do something and then there's a consequence, right? And oftentimes our response in the consequence is, well, I wouldn't have got caught if they didn't open their dumb mouth, right? Or, well, I, yeah, well, everybody else is doing it. Why am I the only one getting caught? 
And so that's not a champion's mindset in God's, God's kingdom. Amen? And so we want to look at something a little bit different. But Daniel lived in a time where Israel was kind of living like that, and they were paying the price for it. But Daniel, he did something different. He stood against the milk toast norm, and he stood for the kingdom of God. And what I love about Daniel's story is that even when Daniel looked like he was losing, God was just setting the stage for him to win big time. Isn't that cool? In the Bible, the Bible says that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. So just when you think you're losing, if you give God room to move, God can show up and show off just like he's done in Daniel's life. And so when we don't stand, guess what happens? We run the risk of becoming lukewarm believers. And when we are lukewarm believers, history will repeat itself. And I'm not talking about the good part of history. I'm talking about the oppression and the ugly things that God wants no part of for his people. And so last week, I'm just going to rub this in a little bit. I watched the service. I wasn't here in the building with you. I was actually in Mexico on this beautiful resort. But thanks to our tech team, give them a round of applause. Uh, they allowed me to tune in from a water park. Now, I'm just going to share this for a second. If you've never been to a water park without kids, it's incredible. I had no idea how awesome it was going to be. Like, I didn't even care if anybody else's kids drowned. I was just there for me. I haven't hurt myself on the elbow going a little bit too hard. You know what I'm saying? Going down one of those slides. It was incredible. We had a great time. But because of uh, the tech team, we were able to watch. And the service was incredible. Didn't Bud do a great job? The worship team, the tech team, all the guys did an incredible job. Thank you so much for serving well and giving us the opportunity to take a part of that and to be on an amazing resort without you guys. And so today, uh, last week, Bud talked about something very specific. He talked about standing out. And when, when you follow God, God's going to give us an opportunity to stand out even though we don't have what everybody else has. And so in, in this instance last week, right, they, they were eating all these fine foods, and Daniel and his peeps are like, listen, just give us vegetables. We want to be vegans, right? And, and people think, well, that should be the diet that we should do, and that's going to make me awesome like Daniel. I want you to understand something. The Holy Spirit got involved and did something supernatural in them, right? Now, I'm all about a plant-based diet. I love that. I'm still a meditarian, but I still like my plants too, okay? But I want you to know that what happened in Daniel's case is because he had a great faith in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so he stood out because of the God that stood for him. And so we're going to talk about a little bit something different today. Instead of standing out, we're going to talk about standing up. Everybody say standing up. See, becoming a champion in kingdoms, God's kingdom requires that we actually take a stand and stand up for something. We've all heard the term, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything, right? And that's the truth. And so I want to just, before we talk about standing up for what's right, because that's what the message is, becoming a champion who stands up for what's right, I want to ask you this question. Show of hands, if you've ever had a friend run an idea past you that was a little shady. Come on. Yeah. Now, Show of hands, if you've had a person, a friend, run an idea past you that was a lot of shady. <laughs> okay? Completely criminal. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, yes, I know you guys. Yes, yes, right? Right? How about this? How about, has, have you ever had a friend that's run an idea past you that was about revenge, about getting revenge, right? And you're like, yeah, you should do it. You'll feel better. Not true. Not true. You'll feel horrible about yourself and you'll be in jail. Number two. Maybe for those who are in school right now, maybe you've had a friend text you, hey, here's the answers to the test, and they've given you an opportunity to cheat on a test. Have anybody ever happened that before? If you're not raising your hand, you're the person who sent the text. You know what I'm saying? Right? Yeah, we know who you are. So, and, and then and here's, the, here's the other thing, uh, is maybe there's somebody who's, who's getting ready to be in a relationship, and they're telling you, about this opportunity they have to compromise sexually in their relationship and do relationship their own way instead of looking at what God might say. See, we've all have seen these instances. We've all been around these instances. And if we're going to be truthful, if we're actually going to get ministered today by the word of God, 
we actually have to come into this a little bit a little bit and say if we're honest we've all walked into those situations where we should have said something and we should have challenged somebody to do the opposite of what their flesh wanted to do but we kind of chickened out turn to your neighbor and say i confess i've been a chicken lord god i've been a chicken and i'm going to tell you as a pastor there's been times in my life where somebody runs a really crappy idea past me that I know is going to break the heart of God. And there's been times where I didn't take the time to say, hey, that's just blatantly sinful. And God has better for you. Now, there's been hundreds of times where I haven't, but I'm going to be honest with you. There's times where I've just shut my mouth. Right? And, and so there's times where I've been chicken. Show of hands here. If you are a non-confrontational person, right? Like, and then there's some people in the room who are really non-non-confrontational and you chose not to raise your hand because you don't want the person next to you thinking that <laughs> you're judging them, right? I mean, you got in your head a little bit. And then, in a show of hands, if you don't have any problem at all confronting issues, right? We got some true gangsters, some ride or dies in the house today, right? We do, right? And, and so I'm gonna tell you a little story about my wife because uh, my wife is a non-confrontational person. Just want you to dial into this for a second. Last year, Kim went to Quick Trip. I love Quick Trip. And she, a guy was out front, and he was asking everybody for money. Now, sometimes people ask for money. Not money. He was asking for food. Sorry. But a lot of times when people ask for food, what they're really asking for is that you just kind of give them money. They don't really want the food, right? Well, she really wanted to help this person. She kind of talked to him heard the story was ministering the word of God loving on them and she felt impressed that she needed to get this guy food if he's hungry she doesn't want him to go without food and so she walked inside he got whatever he wanted they walked outside she wished him well in the name of Jesus and then she went to her car and he put the food down and kind of hid a little bit put something on top of it and he went back out and started asking for money now the non-confrontational side of my wife walked right out of her car as he's talking and asking this other person for money, food, and she says, hold on a second. I just got him food. This is her non-confrontational side. He does not need food. He has food. I got him whatever he wanted. And she said, and you, sir, need to go back and sit down and eat your food. <laughs> Grown, stinking man. I said, are you crazy? You almost got murdered. And guess what he said to her? Yes, ma'am. And he went back and he ate his food. <laughs> Come on. There's just some crazy confrontational people in this world. Guess what? You can stand for what's right. You can stand for what's right. You can st We've been told in this culture today that you can't stand for what's right, but you can stand for what's right. And here's what I've discovered is that when it really comes to confrontation, there's really two major extremes that stop us from getting healing. And the first confrontational extreme is this. There are some people who are just unwilling to take a stand. And believe it or not, here's the truth. It only makes issues worse. Paul tells us that believers are equipped to stand against evil. Here's what he says. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that, everybody say so that. Anytime in the Bible it says so that, get your pen out and say, I'm going to be a disciple. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. If you don't put on the full armor of God, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be out of shape for Jesus' work. And here's what I know. Evil is coming. It's coming against your children. It's coming against your marriage. It's coming against your finances. It's coming against our church because the gospel is being proclaimed here. It's coming against your sanity and your sexuality and your moral compass. And God's people are called to do something about it in the culture. Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 18, God's speaking. He says this. He says, when I say to a wicked person, you will surely die and you do not warn them or speak out to dissuade them. He's saying essentially, when I've told you something and you're too chicken to do it, 
dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, the wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. Hear me, church. Speaking biblical truth against sin is needed. It's needed. I've ministered to many people who confessed being molested. And while their angst and their hurt is partially for the person who committed the horrific act, they always bring up this one thing, almost 100% of the time. But you know what hurts the most is I told this person, and they told me it was my fault. Or I told this person, they told me, that we're just going to keep away from them, we're not going to do nothing about it. I told this person, and here's what they're saying, and the person was unwilling to stand against evil. The most hurtful thing you can do is not stand against evil for those who don't know the kingdom of God. And so today we know this, that there's one extreme where some people are completely unwilling to stand. And then the second extreme is this, is that some people are more than willing to stand unlovingly. And there has to be a balance. Amen? Listen, I love it when people stand for truth in love but I can't stomach it when even I myself stand for truth and I'm ugly about it. And I've done it more times than I would like to admit. And so some people are more than willing to stand unlovingly. They do what we call drive-by confrontations. You know what that is. They come in and they, oh, no, you didn't, and this and that, and you'll always be, and you're this. And they got a lot of words starting with Bs and Fs. You know what I'm saying? And it's not best friend. You know what I'm saying? And, And here's the deal. They will say what they say, and then they go live the most bitter life after it. And they say, oh, I'm good. I'm good. I got it out. No, you didn't get it out. Because to get it out is to forgive it out. They didn't get it out. They didn't forgive it out. They just spoke their peace. Drive-by confrontation. People do this on social media all the time, especially really old Christians. True story. And here's what I know. For God's people who believe in Jesus, we have to learn a better way to stand for truth. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Amen. Somebody had to say it. You know what I'm saying? Somebody had to say it. Because here's the thing. There's going to come a time in your faith walk, even this week or next week or next month, where your child's going to make a really crappy decision. You're going to have to take a stand in love. There's going to come a time when your relative is going into bankruptcy and you see that something could be done and you're going to have to say something and you're going to speak truth and love. You can't control the outcome, but you're going to be the one who said something. There's going to come a time when your spouse is taking you for granted and you've been too scared to say something because they power up and they ego up and you're going to have to say, listen, I'm feeling disrespected, but I love you. There's going to come a time when someone in your small group is having an affair and you're going to have to call it out in love and be willing to walk through it. See, what we do is we say, oh, there's drama. I don't want to be part of the drama. And God's like, listen, we can be part of the recovery. You can't. If they don't want help, they'll go away on their own. But they shouldn't be going away because we were unloving. Amen? If we're going to be in Christ, let's be in Christ. Here's the deal. If you ignore it, you damage them. And if you're hateful and without holding love, you damage them equally as much. It's one and the same. It's just a different approach. And so today... As we learn from Daniel, my prayer is that we learn how to stand up for the kingdom of God in a way that brings God honor, power, praise, and glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we come here today. God, we're going to magnify you in all we say and do. God, we're going to pray that your word comes into our hearts and begins to shape and transform us, and you mold us and make us like clay, God, and you shape us into your image and your likeness. And God, we would push out the things that we want as a part of our image And God, we ask your image to come in and we would become image bearers of the one true king. Lord, we love you. We ask that we would hear this word and apply it to our lives because the power of Jesus rests in us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So if your Bibles, Daniel chapter four, King Nebuchadnezzar was an evil dude, right? He was so evil, Saddam Hussein idolized him and believed he was the reincarnated version of him. And so here's what I call him. I got a, his name's King Nebi. That's his rap name for me. You know what I'm saying? King Nebi has this dream that completely rocks him. 
And so he has the interpreters and the guys come in to interpret this dream and it was kind of an easy assignment. They, they should have had no problem doing this, but they feared the king's response to what their interpretation would be. So it's not that they couldn't interpret the dream because of fear of standing up for what's right. They wouldn't. We've all been there. We just agreed on that. So Daniel, who's about 50 years old, he gets called up to the big leagues. Let's call Daniel. He's done it before. He'll do it again. And so Daniel, guess what? He's going to do it. He's going to do what's right, and he's going to stand up for God. And so he tells, the king tells Daniel this. He tells him his dream. He says, there was a large tree in the middle of the earth. It grew tall and strong, and it reached to the heavens. The fruit and the shade and the whole earth benefited from this tree. The birds nesting in the branches benefited also, but the Holy One from heaven was going to scatter the fruit, chase the animals from the shade, and cut it down. Lead the stump in the ground. So everyone will know that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world. And the Bible says that Daniel hears this and he was perplexed, not because he didn't understand it, but because he's going to have to relay it. And the Bible says his own thoughts terrified him the exact same way when you're going to have to take a stand and you're thinking, oh crap, they're going to get mad at me when I tell them this. Oh crap, they're going to get mad when I tell me this. Except King Nebuchadnezzar was known for doing some really nasty stuff like throwing people in fires and throwing people in lion's dens. And Daniel had already seen God move, but let's just be honest. Even though you've seen God move, Satan's in the back saying, this time he ain't going to move. You know what I'm saying? And that's why we don't move as believers. And so Daniel says, okay, here's the deal. I'm not going to be a coward. I'm going to stand up for what's right. And here's why Daniel stood up for what's right. Number one, because it was the right thing to do. Isn't that that's simple? I'm going to do this because it's the right thing to do. Number two, because I want King Nebuchadnezzar to know my God is the God of all. I want him to know him personally as Lord and Savior. And so here's what he says to King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is in uh, the, the new Larry version. It's, yo, bro, homie, Sir Mix-a-Lot. I wish my interpretation applied to your enemies, but your majesty, you are that tree, you know, the tree that held all that up that everybody benefit from, you are that tree. And he's like, but don't kill the messenger, bro. <laughs> Come on, let me get through this. You have become great and strong and your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your dominion extends to distant parts of the earth. He's like, Nebi, you're kind of a big deal. But how many of you know this is true, that when you personally, when we get a little bit extra money, we get a little more power, we get a little more freedom, and we don't place God in the center of our life, that our ego outgrows our britches. Come on now, you know it's true. People all the time, they come to church, God starts doing miracles in their life, and they take back over control, and their life goes back down the same dark tunnel. And God still loves you, but the question is, are we still loving God? And so, here's the truth. If you, somewhere in your life, get a large sum of money, or a large amount of responsibility, and your life drastically changes, and you step into your ego, and you don't place God in the center of it, it's not because the money changed you. It's because deep inside of you was a character defect of sin that had no idea, that wasn't honest with yourself about it. See, getting more doesn't change us. It just exposes the sin that's already in us which means that we just repent if we hear the truth. And so Daniel interprets the dream to this egocentric king and says this, you will be driven away from the people. And he goes, me? The most powerful guy over everywhere? Yeah, right. He says, you will live with the wild animals. And listen, bro, <laughs> I live in a castle. I eat the animals. He says, you will eat the grass like the ox. He's like, I've got the best sh chefs in the world. You'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. He's like, only feather beds for me. I get people who tuck me in at night. And he says, and seven times, Daniel says, will pass by you until you acknowledge that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. 
And so Daniel interprets the dream. It's out there right now, right? He just puts it out there. And he could have stopped right there and he could have said, I did my part. I told him the truth. Peace out. That's not what happened. He takes a legitimate stand for the kingdom of God so that King Nebuchadnezzar would actually come to know God. And he says, King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. He's talking to a wicked person, guys. You know, like the people you want to confront right now are not nearly, have not done nearly as many things as King Nebuchadnezzar has. He says, please accept my advice. Stop what? And do what? Stop what? And do what? Is right. He called him a sinner. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And here's the deal. Some of us don't believe that it's possible for us to change. And here's what we tell ourselves. We, I've always been this way. And, and yeah, yeah, I, you know, you know, other people can do that, but they don't have the same struggle as I do. And all that can be true. But here's the deal. When we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, when we worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he promises when Jesus left that he would send his spirit to live in us. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead would come live in us and give us the power to live through us so that we could do what? Stop sinning and do what's right. Some of you have believed that it's impossible for me to stop sinning. It's not impossible. I believe in the God of the impossible. And so he goes on and says, break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you will continue to prosper. And hear me, church, the kingdom of God doesn't need more political correctness. What we need is believers who love so deeply, who believe in the gospel so completely that today they will believe that they can turn from sin because God lives within. That's what the church needs. That's what we need. And we're going to see it. God, I, I see my sin now. I can turn from it because you live in me. And because of that, he will give you a great mercy for others so that you help others come out of darkness and walk into a marvelous light. I asked you in the beginning, who wants to be in heaven by yourself? You're going to have to stand. You're going to have to stand. See, and our stand is not against people. See, when somebody gossips about you or sins against you or cusses at you or embarrasses you publicly, listen, your, your sin, your, your issue is not with them. It's within the sin within them. So you can look past their flesh acting out and look into them and say, nah, I love that person. I hate the sin. And God's calling us as people of God to look at that. And so to do that, I'm going to tell you what Daniel did. And I pray that, pray that we could mimic this. But there's two prayers that we have to learn. And we must learn the skillful art of prayerful confrontation. Everybody say prayerful. prayerful. Confrontation. Here's what I know. Genuine intimacy only comes through godly conflict. You think genuine intimacy comes by being a peacekeeper, by not addressing it, by letting it smooth under the rug. Absolutely not true. The greatest peace of my life was when somebody told me Jesus was opposite, again, opposite of, of my actions. And I surrendered to that and began to walk with Jesus. God has a better plan than my flesh tells me. You know what I know about my flesh? is my flesh has lied to me thousands of times. And I trust it more than I do God sometimes. But I've learned to trust God more than my flesh because my flesh has always lied to me. It's told me to pleasure itself and do these things and do what feels good for you. God says, please me, and you won't have to worry about that. I will give you everything that's truly fulfilling. And so genuine intimacy only comes through godly conflict. In Galatians, Paul tells the church, he says, dear brothers and sisters, he's endearing, he says, if another believer is overcome by sin, he's not talking about people outside the church. He's talking about the, your family here. This is your family, your family of God. He says, if a believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly or God-like, walking with God in the image of God, should gently, everybody say gently, 
and humbly, say humbly, help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same, everybody say same, temptation yourself. Our first prayer is this. Say it with me. They're going to put it on the screen. Say, God, help me confront with the goal of restoration. Tell your neighbor this. My motive matters. My motive is that you're restored if I confront you. The only way you can be trustable is when your motive becomes restoration. Everything else is selfish and fleshly. I want to confront for the goal of restoration only. Gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. Here's what this shows me. That there's a wrong path that our life can go down. And there's a right path our life can go down. Amen? I want to help them see fit because I saw my sin and I see it now better than ever and God is working and I allow people to, con to challenge me so I can help other people along the path. That way I don't judge them for their sin. I understand their sin because I have sinned as well and I have fallen short of the glory of God, but I love them so much I refuse to leave them there. See how that works? And so here's the thing. When we begin to look at ourselves as in desperate need of God's love, we will begin to love the people that we view as the vilest sinners in the world and we'll begin to think if Jesus gets a hold of their life, something could really happen. And so we, go, we, are, we confront with the goal of restoration. Number two, we confront with the goal, number two, that, that God help me confront with caution. That's our second prayer. Our motive matters, but our approach matters also. Galatians says, be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourselves. Why is he saying that? Because what happens is when we elevate ourselves, we tend to get prideful. Oh, I would never do something like that. Oh, I would never do anything like that. Right? We demonize others. We idolize ourselves. And it comes across so innocently because here's what we say. I just could never understand why somebody would do something like that. Elevate idolize demonize idolize ourself demonize others i'll never understand why somebody could cheat on their wife i'll never understand why people are thieves i can i couldn't I, how, why would somebody be a gossiper why would somebody be a liar i hate liars why would somebody be a drug addict i could never do that and let me tell you yes you could and you have never been closer to it than when you have said a statement like that in your life and God says there's a better way to do this. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at the point you judge another, you are condemning yourselves because you who pass judgment do the same things. Being honest with somebody about the path they're on is different than saying you're going to hell and you're a worthless person. Amen? Completely different. Completely different. Bible says that God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. How do we become humble? We become insanely aware of how much we desperately need God's grace and love over our life to be everything he's called us to be. And apart from that, we really can't do anything of value. But one thing I want you to see is that we have to have prayerful confrontation. And before King Daniel, for Daniel ever confronted the king, I want you to think back. What he was doing, the Bible said he prayed three times every day on his knees. Why did he do that? One, because he knew that his flesh was sinful. Number two, he believed that he needed God's holiness to guide his life. And because of that, God used him even for a wicked king to lead him back to repentance. Now let me tell you, that day, Daniel makes this statement. He begs him not to do the things he's going to do. Guess what happens? The king goes off pridefully, and he does his own thing. And those seven things happened, those seven seasons happened, and there the king was, all messed up. But at a certain point, it says, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Everybody say sanity. Listen, we all just want to not be so crazy, don't we? 
What a gift. If you ain't got nothing but sanity, you got a lot more than some folks. Amen? Start thanking him. And then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. King Nebuchadnezzar says. And Daniel prayerfully stood for what was right. And guess what he did? He trusted God with the results. You're going to give people truth. They're not going to like it. They're going to go the opposite direction. But when they come to their sanity, because living in sin is insanity. When they come to their sanity, guess what's going to happen? They're going to remember that you love them with Jesus and that your motive was to lead them to Christ. And they're going to trust you with their soul. They're going to follow the God that you love. Why? Because he is the God of ages. Church, this is a prophetic picture of Jesus. And now he lived his life for God. Jesus did, right? He stood against false religious people. He stood up to share the Father with those who were far from God, even if it was going to cost him his own life, which it did. And when we lovingly, boldly take a stand for what's right, Jesus stands with us in the fire of it all. That is our God. That is our message. But nothing happens unless we prayerfully, lovingly stand. Let's pray. Father God, we come here today. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We've let things go on in our own houses, in our own lives, God, that didn't bring you honor, glory, power, or praise. But God, you are holy, and you're all-powerful, and we love you. We come here today, and we just say, God, use us in a mighty way. God, we, we know that you love us so much that you sent your only son to die for us. And so, God, we just ask for that same power who raised Christ from the dead. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's my question. Will you stand? If you're a believer, will you stand against the sin in your own life first? That's the first step. Number two, will you then stand for the wayward children? Will you stand for the broken children? All the people who aren't following God are broken children. Will you stand for the defenseless child, the young children, the orphans in their distress? And here's my question. Will you stand for the unborn child? See, that was a conviction over my life in the last couple weeks. 30 children in our city don't get to be born every week. And God said, you got to do something about it. Quit being a coward, Pastor Larry. You got to take a stand. I want you to do it in love. He gave me a vision for it. And I want you to know that as your pastor, that I have to take a stand too. And I have to stand. And, 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 and we're all going to stand. But at different times, it's for the wayward, the, the child who doesn't know God, the defenseless child and the unborn child, but they're all children of God. And maybe for you, God has placed a specific injustice on your heart that you haven't stepped out and lovingly walked into it. I want you to know that if there's a stand in your heart that I want to connect you with a para-ministry, para-church ministry, Christian ministry, that's willing to stand with you. And so if there's something on your heart, I want you to do this. I want you to grab your connection card. I want you to write, I'll stand. And then whatever that, that heart is, I just want to hear it this week. I'm going to start praying over it, asking God for wisdom over it. Because I know God loves every single person. He created us in his image, and he wants to use us in a mighty way. As we bow our heads, I want to pray one more time. Today, maybe some of you came here today, and you've never really stood for God. But if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, which means if we take a stand for him, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And here's what happens is, what this looks like is the God who stood for us when we couldn't stand for ourselves, Jesus, when we place our faith in him, he forgives us so we can help stand with others. And if you want to play, ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you don't have to work your way into the kingdom. You just have to faith your way into the kingdom. And then he will empower you and use you. And it's not hard. It comes with repentance. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're saying, I want Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of my life, I want you to just say, Heavenly Father, I confess 
that I haven't worshipped you. I want to worship you in spirit and in truth. I ask for forgiveness because I've sinned against you, God, and myself. And I want to be forgiven. I receive Jesus, who is the Christ, who lived a sinless life, and he died on a cross in my place. And his blood was shed to cleanse me from my sin. I receive that sacrifice today. Come live in me by the power of the Holy Spirit. Empower me to stand for the Christ who stood for me on Calvary. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that today I want you to mark in your card, I'm accepting Christ as my Savior. It's on the front side, that white bar there. And then, then I want to challenge you to get baptized. We have baptism coming up, and you can mark that on the back. We love you guys. God bless you, and have a great day. The band's going to lead you in worship, and then Amy's going to lead you after that. Have a great day. God bless. Will you stand with us?
Holy Spirit. 